Hello everybody, this is Miss Peachy from WCA Biology B again. And here we are in Unit 2, Lesson 4, Storage of Carbon. And again, I just remind you to go back to our school website, our WCA Biology B website, and be able to um, click on the, the study guide that goes along with the section. And you can kind of follow along with me in today's lesson. So our keywords today are carbon footprint, carbon sink, climate intervention, biomass, flux, greenhouse gases, greenhouse effect, reservoir, and residence time. All right, so again, some review from the previous two lessons. We are again referring to the carbon cycle, and we are again looking at the term carbon sink and carbon source. So it further defines the carbon sink as a place in the ecosystem where carbon is stored. It also says that a carbon sink is often kind oftentimes known as a reservoir. If you think of a reservoir as a place where, like a water reservoir is where water is stored, a carbon reservoir is where carbon is stored. So it's, it's the same um, concept, different term, means the same thing, carbon sink or reservoir, you might see the same thing. When we look at carbon cycle itself, we are looking at the movement of carbon through four main reservoirs. And those four reservoirs are the atmosphere, the ocean, sediments, and the terrestrial biosphere. So terrestrial biosphere is organisms that live on land and in freshwater systems, as well as those in organic matter found in soil. The oceans include the oceans, right? And all dissolved inorganic carbon in the water. Um, sediments include all fossil fuels in the ground. So we're just further kind of defining the, the scope of those particular reservoirs there. Um, and it does say that the ocean reservoir is the largest because it's the biggest to cover 70% of the Earth's land surface, right? It's so, so big, that means that a lot of the ocean is in contact with the atmosphere. So where the ocean is in contact with the atmosphere in the shallow areas of the ocean, we have a lot of carbon exchange. So the movement between carbon between reservoirs is known as flux. So as it moves from the atmosphere to the ocean and back to the atmosphere, we call that carbon flux. It also says that there's less flux found in the deeper parts of the ocean because it's not exposed to the atmosphere. So you don't get that carbon exchange. You're not going to get as much carbon that is stored in the depths of the ocean. And it says each of these reservoirs holds different amounts of carbon. They measure this carbon in units of gigatons of carbon. It's a lot. Giga, right? That's a lot. So we're looking at um, in the rock, we have the most storage, 65 million gigatons of carbon. Fairly little in the atmosphere, only 800. Fairly large in the ocean, 44,000, but compared to the rock, oh, right? Fossil fuels are 10,000 themselves, 37,000 in the deep depths of the ocean, but you'll notice that the plant biomass is only 550. So that's kind of puzzling, if you will. Why would we have such a small amount of carbon in living things in the atmosphere? And the, the, the short of it is that there's tons and tons of flux that's happening between living things in the atmosphere because of the carbon cycle, because we have so many living things that are constantly taking carbon dioxide in and using it through photosynthesis. We have decomposition that's happening where carbon dioxide is being released back into the um, atmosphere, we have respiration, we have carbon being taken up by ocean animals and being used to help make their skeletons and shells. All of this flux leads to low levels of carbon in both of those areas because it's constantly moving from one to the other. It talks a little bit here about how some of that carbon is taken up by ocean animals, such as clams and oysters that produce shells. They take carbon out of the water to build their shells, and their shells are made up of a substance called calcium carbonate, that's CaCO3. Calcium carbonate is basically just limestone. So if you've ever seen limestone before, um, you'll see calcium 
that is what calcium carbonate is. I don't have any limestone on me right now. I usually have a rock or two sitting at my desk, but not one of, of a limestone. Um, chalk, if you've used chalk before, chalk is just very, very refined calcium carbonate. It's pure mineral, basically, without anything else in it. So pure calcium carbonate is actually chalk. So when you're writing on chalk, on the, on the sidewalk chalk, it's not pink or green or whatever. We put colors into them. It's white, naturally occurring. But that's what calcium carbonate is. And it comes from the old shells and skeletons of decomposed ocean animals. Kind of gross if you think about it, but also lots of fun. Um, and then it talks about something called residence time. And residence time is the length of time that carbon spends in a particular reservoir. So let's look at that. And this, I think, is super eye-opening, in my opinion. So residence time in years. Plants, biomass around 9. Oceans around 422. Deep ocean sediments around 3,000 years, but fossil deposits, 10 million years residence time. So why is that important? Well, the reason why it's really, really important is because we're kind of screwing that up right now, human beings, because generally carbon is locked into fossil fuels and into the rocks for long, long periods of time. If we dig those up and burn them, we are now reducing the residence time, right? And we're actually adding additional carbon dioxide by the bucket load into the atmosphere where it would not naturally happen. And that's really kind of the, the biggest issue with burning fossil fuels. It's not supposed to be like that. And it's messing up the carbon cycle. All right, so moving on here to slide number nine. So again, you probably had to pause me or you haven't, you should pause me and go through the questions, watch the videos and come back to this section once you've um, come to slide number nine. So living things can act as a carbon reservoir as well, plants and things like that can. Um, I'm a carbon reservoir too, so are you, right? We're all carbon reservoirs. But again, our mean time for storing carbon is much, much, much less than fossil fuels. During photosynthesis, plants take CO2 up from the atmosphere and they use it to make sugars. They store those sugars long-term into complex carbohydrates like starches and cellulose and stuff like that. And as long as that plant is continuing to grow and photosynthesize, it's gonna have a storage of carbon inside of it. We I like to eat the plants. They're delicious. You probably eat some plants as well. Maybe you're more of a, you know, a meat eater, or maybe you're both omnivorous, or maybe you're just a vegetarian. It doesn't really matter. Regardless, you are still taking in that carbon either from the plants directly or indirectly because you're eating um, plant eaters like cows and things like that. But again, you're taking that into your body and you're using it to make other parts. For example, your DNA has like, um, a carbon, sugar, phosphate backbone to make up your DNA. Oh, that's pretty important, right? Lipids, um, which make up fat and therefore like your, your cell membranes and stuff, also pretty darn important. Use carbon, so it's a very, very important, you know, um, biomolecule, right? And then lastly, it talks about the effect on the carbon cycle that people are having. Your carbon footprint is a measure of the impact that human activities have on global warming and how much carbon they release into the atmosphere by looking at how much fossil fuels you burn, um, by looking at our impact on deforestation. Remember, deforestation is an important part of our impact on the carbon cycle because trees take carbon in from the atmosphere and use it for photosynthesis. If we remove trees, we are therefore removing a very important carbon sink 
or reservoir, right? So deforestation has a huge role on climate change as well because we are removing a carbon sink. So we're not only adding additional carbon into the atmosphere, but we are also removing an important storage facility for carbon, if you will. Um, so greenhouse gases are made up of primarily, there's several different ones. We are talking specifically about carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. There are other greenhouse gases as well, like methane and even water vapor is a greenhouse gas. What greenhouse gases do is they act as a barrier or a blanket to kind of protect the earth and hold the heat in from the earth. So generally sunlight will come and radiate down onto the planet. Light has higher amounts of energy than heat does. They're both electromagnetic radiation, but light can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. Heat can't as easily penetrate down. So when the light comes in, it is absorbed by the ground. It is re-radiated as heat. That heat is trapped under the blanket of the Earth's atmosphere, which is trapped by things like CO2 and methane and water vapor. And it keeps us nice and toasty warm. We like it right? We don't, we don't dislike having that CO2 in the atmosphere because without it, we would be freezing at night. Um, the problem is if you get too much, you get too kind of zealous and you have too many blankets on, you start sweating and you get really, really hot. Well, the same is true with the, the Earth's atmosphere. If you get too much CO2 in the atmosphere, then it starts to jack the Earth's temperature up past where it should be, and that affects lots of things. It affects living things and their ecosystems, their habitats. It's going to have an effect on climate, on weather. Weather is literally driven by temperature changes. So when we have temperature changes, we see huge impacts in weather, local weather, global climate, which is long-term weather over long periods of time. And some of those impacts are just not known yet. Um, there's predictions and there are things we've been noticing like increasing intensities and occurrences of high intensity storms and things like that. But there's also some things we just don't know because it's a very complex system. Um, so the greenhouse effect is how the Earth's atmosphere kind of blocks the heat from escaping those gases trap it in much like the glass that is found in a greenhouse, right? That's why we call it the greenhouse effect. It is a natural occurring effect. The problem is, is when we have an increase in the greenhouse effect due to an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leading to an increase in global temperature. That's the problem. We're exacerbating, which is a fun word, guys, making worse. Exacerbating means to make something worse or to compound the effect of, right? We are exacerbating our natural greenhouse effect by adding additional greenhouse gases. Um, so we have something called climate intervention, and this is a strategy by scientists to study the possibility of finding alternatives to storing carbon to reduce or eliminate global warming. So how can we store carbon if we're not storing it in plants, how can we potentially reduce our um, carbon footprint by reducing the amount of carbon that we are putting into the atmosphere? Um, so these are questions and these are strategies. One approach is to build structures around the world that would suck air through towers to remove CO2, giant carbon dioxide scrubbers, if you will. But again, these are all at this point that kind of thing is pretty hypothetical. So let's work on reducing our carbon footprint. And then, you know, I think we'll probably have to do both at some point as well. All right, so that is the end of Unit 2, Lesson 4, Storage of Carbon. If you guys have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.